What feeling do you get when you drive the 575 horsepower supercharged V8 Jaguar F-Type R? All of them. Discover the powerful performance that makes driving a Jaguar like no other sports car in the world. Learn more at JaguarUSA.com. Pack your bags because we're sending you to the 2021 iHeartRadio Music Festival. iHeartRadio has teamed up with OneOf.com to give you the ultimate trip to Las Vegas. Now through September 14th, claim your free limited edition iHeartRadio Music Festival digital token every day on OneOf.com. The more you collect, the more chances to win. Visit OneOf.com now to claim your free iHeartRadio Music Festival digital tokens. That's OneOf.com. Management Concepts empowers federal leaders at every career level. Their six leadership programs include courses aligned to OPM ECQs and fundamental competencies taught by experts with federal experience. Management Concepts programs combine live instructions with experiential learning, personal assessments, coaching, and online collaboration to deliver the real-world skills you need. Over 10,000 government workers a year choose Management Concepts for their leadership development needs. Learn why at managementconcepts.com. Class is forming now. You're listening to Fox Sports Radio. Radio. I hope it's a happy and safe Labor Day for all of you out there because I'm not sure how safe it is in certain college towns across this country, specifically Baton Rouge, Louisiana, after LSU fell to UCLA, maybe even in Clemson, South Carolina, after the Tigers were stymied by the Georgia Bulldogs. So much to get to today on Fox Sports Sunday, a Labor Day edition, and I'm sure you've seen it on social media everywhere. Our final Sunday with without NFL football until mid to late February of 2022. We have got you covered in that aspect as well. George and I giving you a sense of an NFL preview, uh, MVP talk, and all of that coming up here on Fox Sports Radio. Plus, we may say farewell to an NFL career and how that career of one Cam Newton will be viewed years from now. But we start in college football, George, with a great, great week one for some schools and some leagues because some other schools and some other leagues did not have a great Labor Day weekend, and that is where we start on this Saturday, my friend. Yo, man, um, if anybody didn't look at my Fast Friday picks that I post on my website, bro, then they had a bad day. I predicted, like, damn near perfectly everybody that was going to win. I knew that UCLA was going to beat uh, LSU. That was like a layup to me. Like, I, I could see that a mile away. My Oregon Ducks won. I mean, but like like you said, Dan, there are some college towns that are extremely sad. Baton Baton Rouge, they are they don't even know what to do. They are like, do we do we love Coach Ogeron or do we not? I mean, he just yeah. won a national championship in 2019, and there are people already like, this is not the guy. <laughs> just that quickly, and re- remember, like two weeks ago, when they announced that. LSU was going to be playing USC in 2024 in Allegiant mm-hmm. Stadium in 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 Las Vegas. What was the initial conversation? Well, the initial conversation was making fun of the alliance. That no, was, no, that no, was no, 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 right no, away, no, 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 no. Yeah, oh, well, well, yeah, yeah. Well, true, just but, saying, like, all right, the Pac-12 already. Then you know, day the alliance is a day old, and the Pac-12 yeah. has signed up with an SEC school. But okay, so then well, what was the next thing? Um, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna guess because I I don't know I'm gonna say maybe Coach O against his uh, former school that he had coached at one point. Nope it was okay. it was uh w- what's the the over uh, the over under of one of the coaches that will the current coaches of USC and LSU will they be the head coaches when they play in 2024. Okay. All right. Like, well, I didn't see that storyline. Oh, I must okay. have missed it somewhere. Well, I was that's too busy. not that far away is the point, is that it's not that far away and that people are already calling for people's jobs. Well, let's let's then let's start there. Let's start with, with what happens in Louisiana and what happens at LSU. Because if you look at Ed Orgeron's record in his time 
with the Tigers. They're 45 and 15. They have a national championship that is, check the calendar, uh, not even two years old. And we are already, there are already rumblings, as you said, that he could be out of a job. Very reminiscent of what happened to Gene Chizik at Auburn after they won their national championship and was let go a few years later. But my, my point is, I, I, I think that we, we rush to judgment too quickly and we forget a coach's strengths and we immediately look at the weaknesses and what needs to change. And I think that that is like half of college football, maybe more than half, is just getting great players, right? Yeah. Isn't that that's that that's what it is? And so, if that's the strength of Ed Orgeron, that is what you need to do at LSU. And you look at recruiting classes in the in the past, and you look at since he took over in 2016, it's been the 2021 class. And I'm just using, I'll just use a generalization of recruiting class because there's rivals there's 24 7 there's scout bunch of different ones but 2021 top five class maybe third to fifth uh 2020 top five class same thing 2019 around the same number 2018 they were maybe in the in the low teens maybe in 10 11 12 13 around that area and 2017 eighth so recruiting wise it's there there's something in my mind that is not being translated from the recruiting to then wins on the field, but really, George, the wins have also been there. If he's 45 and 15 with the national championship and an unbeaten season, so I just, I, it's not that LSU can't do better. It's just in my mind, how can you do this so quickly after a guy's won a national championship less than two years ago? See, I, I understand that fans are, you know that that fans that they demand, you know, success and that they want repeatable performances. And they're looking at Alabama, they're looking at Clemson, and they're saying, all right, look, these teams make it to the college football playoff every year. Why can't we, if we are, you know, we've got this great name, we have a, a coach and all of this stuff. So they want the consistency. And Ed Ogeron, for for some reason, right, when you look at him and, and when you look at what he's done, and then last year the team was so incredibly bad. Like they obviously lost from the 2019 national championship team, I think six first rounders or it, it was mm-hmm. an exorbitant amount of talent. But the fact that last year the defense looked so incredibly bad and that's what LSU is known for like that that 2019 year was like an outlier in terms of LSU offense so that's where people are frustrated and I, and I, and I guess the biggest problem with Ed Ogeron is that it doesn't seem like that the team is trending in the right di- di- direction but this year I don't think that that's a fair assessment because you only played one game and UCLA, I believe, is an extremely good football team. So I think the overreaction is more about people not understanding how good UCLA is as mm-hmm. opposed to judging LSU. What do you think uh, and what do you think that Chip Kelly's strength is as a head coach? I'm just using because you oh, mentioned UCLA. Oh, okay, he is he his his offense. I mean, he's one of the innovators of modern yeah. offense, yep. and now he's reinvented his offense. And he is organized. He is you, you know his team doesn't play sloppy like the, like every single year he's been, been there. Mind you, he only got his first two non conference wins this year. But every year, the team looked to be getting better in different areas. And last year, you could see in the pandemic year, you could see, oh, wow, this defense might actually be really, really good. And this year, through two games, you're like, this defense is outstanding. So I think it's the organization and then just the fact that you see incremental gains every year. And and, and I think that Chip Kelly, when we use this argument, it's perfect because when you look at what's Nick Saban's strength, uh, he gets the best players and he gets the best coaches. Yep. Like, I, I, I mean, the, the operation that he runs, and it, it's it's not meant to downplay. What it's supposed to do is just simplify of why Alabama, why Alabama 
is just such a juggernaut. And so that's where the gap is at LSU, though, because they're getting good players. They're getting really good players. But it's the coaching that that seems to be the issue. And so when you win a national championship and you lose assistance to other jobs, whether it be in the in the NFL or if it's other head coaching jobs like LSU had, you have to restock that or you have to replenish that. And I think that's where that's where the gap is at LSU. And the thing that I think for everybody who's rushing to judgment about Ed Orgeron needing to be out at LSU is I do think it's a job that would be highly coveted in college football. That would be a place where where coaches would want to go and coaches would want to be. But it's also of are we going to be getting better players? Are we going to be able to keep that or even raise it to the next level than where we are right now? And I think that's a legitimate question to ask. The, the problem isn't with Ed Orgeron at LSU, in my mind. It's There's just something that's not being translated when you're bringing in these, to these type of players and now they're not tra- it's not translating on the field or you're getting beaten by other schools. If you're in the recruiting rankings where they are, it tells me that some of these guys need to be coached up a little better and that's the fault of Ed Orgeron, not anything that he's done because I don't think you can fault his coaching style because there have been CEO types. There have been guys who have looked over. There are guys who are recruiting guys. There are, there are geniuses like Chip Kelly. There are you know, guys like Ryan Day now at Ohio State who are bringing their version of their offense. He's a Chip Kelly disciple. Like there, There's different types of head coaches, and I think that's what we have to realize with that Orgeron is maybe it's his assistants. Maybe, maybe, maybe they've got to get the you know, Nick Saban where Bill O'Brien will Ex- you know, let see, go of a head coaching job and go to Alabama. That's maybe that's a, what happens needs to happen at LSU and not get rid of Coach O. See, that's a very reasonable assessment, right? Is that that is that he doesn't call plays? He doesn't, you know, he's not what he's not Lincoln Riley. He's not Chip. He's not mm-hmm. Ryan Day. He's not any of those those guys. And there's nothing wrong with a CEO type head no. head coach. Very. And common. if you notice in their national championship season, all their assistants left. The uh, their their de- defensive Bre- coordinator yeah. he left to be the head coach at Baylor. Um, Dave their uh, yep. office coordinators left for head coaching jobs, and then uh, office coordinator with the with the Panthers. Joe and Brady. I don't yep. think, yeah, he didn't replace them with the type of talent, I guess, to to get it done. And so I think that that's a fair point. It, it is something about you, Dan. I'm telling you, this 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 baby has gotten <laughs> has gotten into you because now that you are Daddy Dan Buyer, I have never I, agreed with you more than what's going on right now. Well, the, you know, the, truly, I am fresh off of a nap of about an hour ago. I was telling the guys before the show that one of the toughest things to do when you have a four month old is figuring out what you need to do with the little time that you have. So the, yes. wife, the, the wife takes the baby, and I'm broadcasting from home, but she goes, takes the ba- baby, and they go to grandpa's place, and they you know have a fun time for three hours while we're doing the show. She left an hour early today, and I'm like, my goodness, what am I going to do? This you know, is do- a gift. <laughs> yes, yes. So it was a quick power nap. So that's why I came out, and I was fresh and ready to go because I, I was able to take advantage of the 40 minutes minute nap that is so crucial that so many of us uh, so many of us need to have but i mean coach o, and just quickly getting back to him 45 and 15 and that is last year included which not that we're giving passes for pandemic years but remember jamar chase didn't play at all for them last year they were trying to replace the team that had won the national championship so maybe it was even a little bit more difficult on lsu than it was on some other schools so you take that out of the equation and he's 40 and 10 you know i mean nick saban wins at like an 85 90 percent rate so there's nothing you can do about that but that's an 800 winning percentage and I know that yesterday, the, the, maybe how yesterday played out, George, was the surprising fact of it. That L- yeah, they that L- around. Yeah, yeah. The UCLA was more physical with them. And maybe that is cause for concern. But if you step back and take a look, I think you really just need to assess the problem. And it's, it's the problem of going up against Nick Saban in Alabama because nothing is ever good enough because you are always competing with them. And if you feel like you're a step back, of of you know from maybe the year before, then you're three or four behind Alabama. Nick Saban doesn't make it on easy on anybody. See, and this is another example. I, sometimes I think that teams are not realistic with where they are. Right? Is if you're LSU, 
you got a national championship now. You well in 2019, you got one while Les Miles was there. The 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 program is still something that you can be extremely proud about. You see mm-hmm. what I'm saying? And oh, that, yeah. and that LSU is like a. I'm sorry. Um, you have uh, Alabama is a once in a. You know, like the. When when is the last time somebody has had this level of dominance in any sport? Like you got to go back to like the uh, last time was UConn in women's basketball, and they don't even dominate like they did anymore mm-hmm. because there's more parity. Yeah. And so what Nick Saban is doing, what six national championships in twelve years, that's in, that, like that can't be the goal. Like the goal has to be. Like there, there are people who even try to criticize Lincoln Riley. You're like, this dude's in the playoff every single year. Yeah. I, I get he hasn't won it, but you're not going to win it every year. Like if he wins once every six years, you, it, it, I, I promise you, as much as I want my Oregon Ducks to win a national championship every year, if we are, if we win, you know, nine or ten games a year, and then win a national championship once every six years, Dan, I will die a happy man. Sure. As far as college football goes, I well, mean, wouldn't wouldn't if if somebody told you that about the Seahawks or oh, the sure. Milwaukee Bucks, well, what would you say? Yeah, I, I mean, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you can't even take LSU, George, because two thousand three they win it all with Saban. Two thousand seven, you mentioned they win it all with Les Miles, and then it's two thousand eleven they come back and they end up losing to Alabama in the national championship game after they what beat them in the in the regular season. So you had the you had the rematch, but that also tells me is that you know what that is? That's a that's a that's a secular, very very in step because of the classes. 2003 moves on then you bring in the 2007 class and they you know like like those are the years it's an every three or four year cycle with them and it worked out for them and that's much more success than a lot of schools in college football a majority of the schools in college football and yeah it's been a little while then it was you know it took until 2019 but that's only an eight-year gap of when you were playing in a national championship game which isn't I mean other schools would kill for something like that. You yeah, are one hundred percent right about that one, buddy. Yeah, yeah, and the, and the recognition. I mean, if you're happy with doing it every four years, like you were, you know, fifteen, you know, ten, fifteen years ago, then you need to give Coach O a little bit more time. He's George Reister. Get him on Twitter at George Reister. You can find me, Dan Byer, on Twitter at Dan Byer on Fox. Coming up next. So, who did have it worse this weekend? The ACC or the Pac-12? Whoa. We'll answer that question next year on Fox Sports Radio. Pack your bags, because we're sending you to experience the biggest music event in the world, the 2021 iHeartRadio Music Festival. For two days, music's brightest stars take stage, and you and a friend could see it live. iHeartRadio has teamed up with OneOf.com to give you the ultimate trip to Las Vegas. Now through September 14th, head over to OneOf.com and claim your free limited edition iHeartRadio Music Festival digital token. Each token unlocks one entry to win. Come back every day and collect another token. The more you collect, the more chances to win. One of is a music-focused NFT platform where you can buy, sell, and collect unique content from your favorite artists. And unlike other NFT platforms, one of gives true fans power by allowing a simple credit card to make all your purchases. Visit oneof.com now through September 14th to claim your free iHeartRadio Music Festival digital tokens. That's one of.com. Uh oh, Brad's buzzed. Oh, yeah? Yeah, he's starting with the woots. <laughs> <laughs> and now a speech. I just want to say that friendship is about heart, heart and brain. Who's with me? Good thing is, he knows when he's buzzed. And my brain is saying, when it's time to go home, somebody call me a ride. Love that guy. Me too. Know your buzzed warning signs? Call for a ride when it's time to go home. Buzz driving is drunk driving. A message from Nitsa and the Ad Council. Fox Sports Sunday. I'm Dan Byer. He's George Reister. Glad to have you with us. The NFL vet, the college football vet as well as we talk what happened yesterday in the world of college football. You're a Pac-12 guy. We just talked about UCLA beating LSU yesterday, George. That was the only thing that seemed to go right for the Pac-12 conference. Whoa. Yes, it, it, I mean it was it it was a rough day for the conference outside of how big that victory is, but I guess maybe that's the million dollar question is does it really matter as long as 
UCLA beat LSU, is it all good for the Pac-12? Um, well, see, Dan, I, I would uh, I would push back a little bit on your assessment of the Pac-12 because, yes, the Pac-12 did have a bad day as it relates to um, – as it relates to uh, Washington losing to Mon- Montana, which is mm-hmm. just absolutely abysmal um, because they lost to an FCS school and th- and they were ranked and people, people like Ryan Leaf picked them to go 12 and 0, which was inexplicable to me to begin with. But um, Stanford getting absolutely taken behind the woodshed by Kansas state. Um, which means intellectual brutality is still broken. Oregon <laughs> State losing. Um, Cal lost to Nevada. Yep. A- Arizona, you expect it to uh, lose. Mm-hmm. And then uh, Washington State finding a way to snatch defeat from the jaws of victory against y- Utah State wasn't good either. But, damn. But but none of these teams aside from Washington was expected to even finish in the top half of the conference. You you actually had all the teams besides Washington who people think are any good win. UCLA won big game. USC won. Oregon won. Uh, Arizona State and Utah won this week. So mm-hmm. like there's the. the I mean, like, it was bad on the bottom half of the conference, but on the top half of the conference, everybody's still swim, swimming along fine. It's it's actually why I think that the ACC had the worst weekend of, of any conference because of how things played out for what oh my was supposed God, to yes. be They're, their they're two schools. best teams. Yes, yes. they're two. The, well, the three. Well, actually, sorry. The three, <laughs> yeah. yeah, the three schools that people thought were going to be the best. So Clemson with DJ Ua Angalele, it was his first start. It did not go well at all. Like, yes, Georgia's pass rush was extremely good, but if you switch out Trevor Lawrence for DJ, you think you get a better performance, right? Yeah. And honestly, and, I, 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 and I Clemson's thought defense. No, go on. Well, I was going to just say the other thing about the other thing about DJ is it's. It was not like C.J. Stroud or Bryce Young making their debuts because we saw D.J. last year at Notre Dame. True, you know, so that, that yeah, that's he what did was so have experience. He played two games l- l- last year. Yeah, started and, and he, two games, and he played really well. And in that marquee game at Notre Dame, you're like, man, they're not going to miss a beat when he steps in. And then you see what happened yesterday, and that's what was so surprising. And that that's that was the other the other takeaway. Like we. We totally gloss over the fact that Georgia only scored, you know, 10 points in the game. No, no, no. no. It, they, well, you know, and, and they only scored three on offense. If yeah. DJ, if DJ didn't throw them a pick six, would, would, would we still be playing right now in a three to three tie? <laughs> I mean, Keep like going, that, Georgia's, Georgia's offense was pedestrian too. But, but to get back to the point, you had Clemson who, offensively looked atrocious, right? And they look very vulnerable, even though that they were playing Georgia, but but still, right? They still look a little mm-hmm. vulnerable. Um, Miami, people were like, yo, this is the year that Miami could be back. Blah, blah. Man, they got drowned by, by Alabama. I mean, it was just bad. If Alabama had wanted to score more points, they could have scored more than the forty-four that they did. And um, and that was and, another that was another no. game though, George. Where not if if Miami would have had a good showing, if let's just say they would have lost thirty-eight to twenty-seven, we would say, okay, all right, you know what, Miami was supposed to lose that game anyway, but they fought with Alabama or they hung in there for three quarters. That you, it's that's not what happened. That that's not what happened at all. So you can't you can't even you they couldn't even out say of the that. Game, they were out of the game in the second quarter. Yeah, yeah. It it was over in the second quarter. When that when they went into halftime, it was twenty seven to three, and there wasn't a single person in the stadium that was like, ooh, ooh. But had it been the other way around, everybody would have would have thought, oh, Alabama will make this close in the second half. But then you also had North Carolina lose to Virginia Tech, and Sam Howell didn't look very good. Mm-hmm. So I think that that the ACC by far had the worst day. They they had their three best teams lose, and they are essentially and I and I know that this is early on, 
But Miami ain't making the playoffs. You you Correct. can count them out. North Carolina, they could still technically recover and make the playoffs. Technically, only be- because if they ran the table and then beat Clemson in the uh, ACC championship and finished twelve and one, they technically can get into the playoffs. Um, and but their chances are probably low, depending on what Virginia Tech does. And then you got uh, that Clemson. Clemson still has a legitimate shot, but they got a. But there's no more margin for for error. Like they got to blow the doors off of everybody else on the way through, Un- just- unless Georgia, because because if Georgia wins the SEC, finishes twelve and zero, and they beat Alabama in the SEC championship. Clemson can actually get back in the playoffs because peop- people can look and say, oh, this was, aside from a pick six, this was a three-to-three three football game. Like, th- this might be go a different way. So I think Clemson still has a shot, but it's not good when your three best teams lose on opening I, weekend. Yeah, I, I never want to say a team is out of it. In in I in fact, I don't think that September matters a lot. I think that there, there are very few instances – in college football, where we've seen a September outcome end up come and bite a team in the butt in early December. like that's, There have been very few instances. However, in saying that, and I'm not trying to sit on the fence with this, the problem for Clemson is, yeah, they need Georgia to go and do their work. But if Georgia doesn't beat Alabama in the SEC title game, and let's just say that's how it plays out, there's no way that I think that if you had a conversation, even if Clemson ran the table, that you could take Clemson over Georgia in if they were battling for the final playoff spot just because of the head-to-head. The only saving grace that the ACC may have is that North Carolina actually has a game at Notre Dame later on this season where they could win, and then if Clemson keeps on winning – but they're void of their of the good wins, and while the Pac-12, to your point, it was the, it was the bottom of the Pac-12 that wasn't winning, the top of the Pac-12, Oregon's got Ohio State coming up on Saturday, and so if you win that game, now all of a sudden your conference is elevated to another level. There isn't another game in the entire ACC outside of North Carolina at Notre Dame that could even elevate the conference. And that's the toughest thing because you, you could run through that conference, George, and everybody's going to say, well, who did you play? You know, they're, they're no good. Like that's, that's why yes, yesterday and Thursday for North Carolina was so tough on the ACC is because their margin of error was so slim. They, needed, they really, really needed Clemson to beat Georgia, Georgia to set the standard for the rest of the conference. Now it's just an uphill climb. I, I think it's going to be difficult for the ACC. They're going to need a lot of stuff to get, to get right, even though I don't think a lot of the time September matters. But if it comes down to it, if Georgia and Clemson are both one-loss teams, how in the world do you take a Clemson, even though they're a conference champion, over the team that beat them in the first week of the season? Oh, you, you can. You can't. <laughs> you can't. It, it. There's no way. There. Yeah. There's no way that you can't because head to head matchups matter. And truthfully, the only place where they actually try to discount those types of things is in the SEC. They're like, oh well, if if you played them twenty five times, then Alabama would win twenty three. Then well, it. But they. But they didn't this time, so it sure. doesn't matter. I think there's. I think there could be some interesting debates. I think there could be if Clemson ends up running the table. I think that there could be debates if we're down to it about maybe even a two loss school in, in in maybe the Big Ten. You know, as it turned out, the Big Ten openers were great because they didn't have to have all of their top teams lose because some of their top teams were playing each other. It was great for Penn State and it was great for Iowa with this past weekend. Maybe not so much for Indiana and Wisconsin, but we're not looking at the Big Ten as being a weaker league because of of what happened of like an Illinois losing it over the weekend. We're not looking at it like that, but that's how we are looking at the ACC and PAC 12 still's got still has time. And as you said, their big pieces are still unblemished. Get George yeah. on Twitter at George Reister. You can find me on Twitter at Dan Byer on Fox. Want to look like a million bucks, but only spend a handful of bucks upgrade to a dollar shave club, six blade razor for a noticeably smooth shave. Thanks to their six precision cut stainless steel blades. Find your perfect shave wherever you shop in store and online at dollarshaveclub.com. That's dollarshaveclub.com. Welcome to the club. 
Ralph Irvin's a part of the club. He brings us the latest of what's going on on this Labor Day weekend Sunday. What's happening, Ralph? You guys are doing all this calculus when it, it comes down to four simple figures. UCLA will be in the final four, so who cares? No, They'll be undefeated. <laughs> there you go. Uh, so you're, 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 forgetting, you're forgetting that calculus. That they look just, The only person more impressive was Alabama this week. So that's all that, that really matters. I'll Maybe. tell you what. Ohio State's game on Thursday after seeing us some of the top teams perform. Maybe you're saying, you know what? Maybe C.J. Stroud looked a better, little bit better than we thought at first blush <laughs> considering how uh, some of the others showed up yesterday. Yeah, and speaking of showing up, the American League East did not show up today. Uh, Minnesota, a ninth inning RBI from Nick Gordon snaps a three-game Twins losing streak. They beat Tampa Bay 6-5, but down the standings, well, the Yankees gave up four in the seventh inning. They fall to Baltimore 8-7, and Cleveland had a five-run ninth inning to cap a 11-5 win over Boston. So everybody at the top of that division was in the losing column tonight. The Mets, a six-run ninth inning, that capped a 13-6 win over Washington. Right now, though, Atlanta, top team in the NL East, has a 9-2 lead over Colorado. That is in the bottom of the eighth inning. St. Louis still trying to stay alive in that National League wildcard race. They have a 5-1 lead as they play at Milwaukee. Tyler O'Neill, a two-run homer there for the Cardinals. And Houston still trailing at San Diego. The Padres had a three-run first inning, and that's all it's taken. 3-1 the Padres over the Astros in the fifth inning. Now at the PGA Tour Championship, they're on to the 18th hole, and Patrick Cantlay still in the lead spot at 20 under par, one shot ahead of John Rahm. Again, on the 18th hole, also on the 18th hole, the second-to-last grouping that features Kevin Na. He is five shots back of the pace, and there's one match still on the course at the Solheim Cup. The U.S. two points behind, eight and a half to six and a half to Team Europe. As we send it back, it is Fox Sports Sunday. Dan Byer and George Reister. Thank you very much, Ralph. Get George on Twitter at George Reister. Find me on Twitter at Dan Byer on Fox. We were talking about Alabama in Miami, and I, I don't know if it's even fun anymore watching Alabama. I, I, I really? just, I, I mean, there is like you know, you mentioned their 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 greatness earlier, and. I mean, it is one of the, one of the great things about yesterday and and about this first weekend is I mentioned the the quarterback play. We talked about uh, Clemson and DJ Ungalale um, having the Uy Ungalale having the uh, I don't know I, you can't say a baptism because as we mentioned he had already started a couple of games, but the season opener was just tough and going up against that Georgia defense was tough. Made a joke about C.J. Stroud because there seemed to be Thursday night and then Friday morning such a reaction to the Ohio State quarterback who, if you just looked at the numbers, had a great game, but maybe if you watched the three and a half hours, there were there were you know a little left a little bit more to be desired there. But Alabama just comes in, brings in Bryce Young, looks like. Looks like he's been there for five years. Uh, Jamison Williams comes in as a transfer from Ohio State, gets a 94-yard touchdown reception. I mean, it just it doesn't stop, and it is, I, I, you know, and, and then saying this is as, as a fan of a school that's trying to trying to knock off Alabama. Maybe that's maybe that's the bias coming in, but at some point, George, to me, it's just going to be patriot like, where it's like, can you just show that you, that you're human like the the only time that we've really seen it was when Tua went down with his hip injury you know and you had to have something drastic happen where you're like oh my goodness you know the 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 Alabama football program actually may be in a little bit of a shaky spot here it had to be you know unfortunately a serious injury for anything to derail what Alabama has been doing and that's that's the frustrating thing I think of anybody who's trying to catch Alabama is even the top teams, even Spencer Rattler yesterday had a tough day against Tulane and, and getting picked off a bunch of times. Oklahoma still wins, but you're saying, all right, there's these growing pains, and Alabama just doesn't seem to have it. Well, see, here's, here's the thing is that Alabama does something that other teams, some teams strive to do it, and then some teams don't pay attention to the details as much. So, yes, Alabama recruits at an extremely high level, which 
you know, is the difference between winning and losing a lot of games. But one of the other things that Alabama does, they are in attention to detail. Like they do not beat themselves. They rarely commit a lot of penalties, not a lot of personal fouls. Like they, like they keep the, like they do the, and they don't turn the ball over a lot. And those are the things that like not turning the ball over is the biggest uh, correlation between winning and losing the whoever wins the turnover battle pretty much wins every single game it's like 85 percent or something like that and then if you add on it where uh, if you get a defensive or a special teams touchdown you're at like 98 percent chance to win so i it, that's one of the things that they do extremely well and i for one am not bored by alabama probably because i spent 10 years like betting against Alabama. I was like, listen, they're overrated, (laughs) blah, blah, blah. And they're not. So now I can fully enjoy it. And then seeing that I got a chance to see Bryce Young play in high school. So I'm kind of invested in, in him and, like they just seem to pick the right players, like what whatever their eva- evaluation process is, because you'll see uh, like if I'm looking at the recruiting rankings right now and when you go back to 2021. Right. And, and, and my mind you, Alabama gets some of the benefit of the doubt with some of these recruits that after they commit to Alabama, they actually get a bump in the ratings. Uh, but. If you look at Alabama, Alabama actually signs more three stars than even uh, like some of these some of these other schools. Like they like they'll 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 sign four or five three stars, and then yes, they'll get a bunch of five stars and four stars too. But the fact that they don't really care about the evaluation, I'm sorry, that about the ranking process, and Mm -hmm. they're like, we're gonna get guys that fit this criteria. And if he's a three-star, so be it. If he's a five-star, so be it. And that's the thing that I really love about it. And that's the thing that I actually think that you'll see a lot from Chip Kelly as well. And I think he can turn UCLA into a juggernaut if he can continue to uh, win. Because then he will be able to recruit players from all over the, the country to be able to fit his system. So I'm all in on Alabama at this point in point in time. They are fun to watch. And it's the way football is supposed to be played. Uh, the 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 Alabama juggernaut is just. I mean, it it, it is truly just rolling and rolling <laughs> and rolling. But it's it's not reminiscent of. And you just mentioned UCLA, and I just wanted to make this point because it dawned on me last night as I'm watching it. When I moved to Southern California in 2005, it was in the middle of the heyday of USC football, and again. Nothing rivals the Lakers or the Dodgers in this town when it comes to those teams. However, USC was such a story, and it was it was such an interesting feel because of how just that program rolled on and how people were invested in it. And it's been quiet for the last decade or so. It hasn't been like that. And so to even, even if it's UCLA, to have a college football program in Southern California be you know worthy of attention or worthy of people getting excited, I was actually excited for that. It doesn't mean I'm going to be a UCLA fan. Just it feels different in the fall that you're not just only focused on Dodgers in the postseason and Lakers training camp. I know there's two NFL teams here now, but it's just it's a different town. But now you could have you could have that sort of energy just on the street at Westwood like that's that that's what I oh, yeah. I took from yesterday which was a little you know was which was man this this could actually you know reverberate throughout the city but man the Alabama thing is just is just tough plus guys are willing to wait at Alabama like you know like Ohio State I think played eight true freshmen in their game on Thursday against uh against Minnesota and and you know Alabama like just like all right you know we'll get our opportunity you know you'll You'll get your opportunity to shine and move on and move through the program and yeah, just it's just it's just getting old because they just seem so far ahead of everyone else. And, I, and there was a time when I thought that Ohio State and Clemson caught them, and then you saw what happened in last year's national championship you, game. In you know, and, yeah, but the difference is is that last year's offense for Alabama was historically good, mm-hmm. and this team is not as good as last year's team. However. <laughs> that I, I I think that yesterday on display you saw two things. Alabama's really good and they're they're consistent, but that Miami's also nowhere near 
a really good football team right now. He's George Reister. I'm Dan Beyer. This is Fox Sports Sunday. There's going to be a new look to college football. We'll talk about that next year on Fox Sports Radio. Hey, this is Jason McIntyre. Join me every weekday morning on my podcast, Straight Fire with Jason McIntyre. This isn't your typical sports pod pushing the same tired narratives down your throat every day. Straight Fire gives you honest opinions on all the biggest sports headlines, accurate stats to help you win big at the sports book, and all the best guests. Do yourself a favor and listen to Straight Fire with Jason McIntyre on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Fox Sports Sunday, I'm Dan Beyer. He's the NFL vet, George Reister, of course, playing his college ball at Oregon. Get George on Twitter, at George Reister. You can find me on Twitter, at Dan Beyer on Fox. I just think that the uh, Big 12 is delaying the inevitable, and I know there's nothing that they could really do, George, but reports surfaced on Friday, Sports Illustrated, then uh, ESPN and others followed that the Big 12 was set to add four schools as Cincinnati, UCF, BYU, and Houston were going to uh, apply to become new members of the Big 12 as soon as this upcoming week. And uh, it just – this stuff naturally happens, George. You you decide who a Power 5 is or a group of 5 is, and it just kind of naturally takes shape. And I think at some point when when we move on a little bit more from this, it's just going to be the Power 4. I, I, I don't think that we're going to look at the Big 12 – as a real Power Five conference, when it comes down to especially football, I, I think the addition. I know that this conference didn't have really anywhere to go, but maybe to add these schools. But I just don't. I think in the end, this will kind of naturally fall into place where we're not looking at the Big Twelve as a Power Five anymore, and we're looking at just Pac twelve, Big Ten, ACC, and SEC. Let me guess: Is George muted? That was there my initial thought, Dan. That was my initial thought mm-hmm. was that they were going to, you know, essentially be a, you know, rele- relegated to group of five status. But then I looked at the teams that they would be potentially adding. BYU has a big following, a big brand, right? Not yeah. in, in terms of independence, not as, not as big as Notre Dame, but they have a huge following. No. Yeah. They're you look at, Yeah. And then you look at Houston. Houston has something extremely special. Houston has what Oregon has. They have an owner, essentially, in Tillman Fertitta. And if Tillman is willing to put the resources into them being a uh, a big-time school, they are going to, uh, you know, fast-track the process of being really good. And then you look at UCF, like I – I do think that these schools can catch up to be power fives really quickly. And so I do think that we're still going to have the five leagues until there's a huge merger between some of these leagues. I, I just wonder how long it is for Kansas or Kansas state or an Oklahoma state to kind of be even a West Virginia of being like, okay, what are we, what are we, what are we doing here? Nobody else is wants this, them. That's yeah. the problem. Nobody else wants them. I, I know, but I think that the landscape could change, and I think that maybe other, you know, I think that the Big Ten, I think they would be open to a Kansas and Kansas State edition at some point. Um, I, and, and that's what I think it's going to be. I don't know if the Pac-12 will look at Oklahoma State. I don't know if it, it makes sense for them, or, but I just think it's going to be a matter of time. I don't, the SEC may look to expand to eighteen. Who knows? Then. It, that I just think that this is this is abandoned the the conference as a Big Twelve, it was their only option. But realistically, I just don't think this. It just turns into the American Athletic Conference and how we view it, and that's how I think we're going to end up viewing the Big Twelve with these four additions. And it's going to take a couple of years for them to get in, but it's just it's, it's a band aid over a much bigger wound. He's George Reister. I'm Dan Bayer. This is Fox Sports Sunday. If it's the end for Cam Newton, how will he be remembered? We talk about it next here on Fox. Fox Sports Radio has the best sports talk lineup in the nation. Catch all of our shows at foxsportsradio.com. And within the iHeartRadio app, search FSR to listen live. I don't know if it's a double standard, George, but there are certain things that bother me when it comes to sports and sports debates and sports talk and chats with buddies and conversations on social media. Can I, can I, tell, you, can I tell you a couple of them? 
Get it off. Get it off your chest, okay. man. Don't hold that this, stuff inside. It this gives is, you your clothes and it stinks. This is what. This is what annoys me is perfect example is I just we talked a little bit ago how just to me Alabama's dominance now is just it's not even fun anymore. It's just it's you know there there is there's not excitement because you just know what's going to happen. There's not a question of of what's going to happen. It's just a matter of when it's going to happen. And I use Alabama as the perfect uh, description here because what I hear what we've talked about throughout the preseason in the NFL are comments like, you know what, I don't know if Jalen Hurts is going to be able to to get the job done in, in Philadelphia. I don't know if he's going to be a starting quarterback. And you know what, the Dolphins need Deshaun Watson. Tua is not the guy. He is not the guy there. And then in New England, and now Mac Jones is the starter there, but there was the debate of, you know, who's going to be the starter, Cam Newton or Mac Jones. So we're we're kind of we're, we're we have the jury still out on Tua, the jury still out on Jalen Hurts, and we have no idea what's going to happen with Mac Jones. But in the same breath, people will say huh, Alabama had a quarterback room where they have three starting quarterbacks in the NFL right now. So it's like in in one hand you're you're propping up Alabama and being like, man, what a factory <laughs> it is. But on the other hand, you're not giving any of their quarterbacks any credit, and in fact are are disparaging them because you don't know if they're going to be starting quarterbacks. And I kind of feel, I kind of feel, George, that that's what happens with Cam Newton. Is there is there's a group of people that have never liked Cam's game, have not liked Cam as a player, have not liked Cam as a person. And then once he gets cut by the Patriots, they say, where can he go to next? So wait a sec. So if you sat there and you've tore him apart and you don't say he's a good quarterback and he can't yeah, do this right? and that. Now Why you're do you trying think to... he would go anywhere next? Yes, exactly. And, the, and, and, and it just it, it bothers me. And I don't know if it's I don't know if it's just a sports media thing. I don't know if buddies do this stuff if, of but it's like you kind of can't have it both ways. Either you believe in the guy or you don't believe in the guy. I oh, believe, you Dan. know, like, like I just, it, it, to me, it just, it happens too often. And those are just two examples that I've noticed recently. Oh, Dan, you went and went all Pollyanna on me. Man. I know. <laughs> it, it is. <laughs> yeah. So you, but, but in, in that you, you are right. But at the same time, you have to realize the point in time that we live in and the way media is treated, Right is that there are so many people that try to put up the front or say, you know, oh, I, they they want to be first to the story. They want to be, mm -hmm. you know, I came up with this great take, so I get credit on the back end. Instead of actually waiting to see what actually happens, which is the most prudent approach, right? Sure. sure. So, so, yeah, everybody wants to, oh, Cam sucks, he's done. Tiger Woods is done. He should never play again. And I was like, yo, Tiger. And, and I'm talking about pre-last oh, yeah. crash. And I'm You're like, right. And I was screaming like, yo, this is one of the greatest golfers of all time. Like, maybe he won't be the as dominant as he was, but he'll win again if he's playing. Like, like a broke clock is right twice a day, especially when you have that type of type of talent. He'll get it right at least once, right? So, and that ended up happening in the, in the Masters in 2019. And I am a believer in that, yes, what did you show on film last? Cam showed, I believe, the, the last time that we saw him in a preseason game, that he's still worthy, number one, of being an NFL quarterback first, somewhere mm -hmm. on the roster. Second thing is, is that there are teams that he can start for, but he's I don't believe he's an upper echelon quarterback anymore because we because for the last three years that we've seen him, well, well, two and then an, an injury year. We haven't seen that. So that's what I take from Cam is I'm like, all right, he's still worthy worthy of being in the NFL, but it doesn't appear that he's still, you know, upper echelon quarterback anymore, which is two separate things. Like you could you could discuss on and and I don't even want to say like Trevor Lawrence because Trevor Lawrence was the first overall pick and, and Mac Jones was a mid first rounder and the mid first rounder beat out Cam. I just yeah, I don't know any scenarios and, and it's not of is Cam better than this guy or is he not better than this guy, but any scenarios where that would fit right now in the NFL in the 32 jobs that are out there. 
Um, even in Philadelphia, yeah. if you have questions about Jalen Hurts, I still yeah, think that he you would like be to, co- yeah, you'd like to know correct. more about him. Yeah, he may be the best quarterback. Like I, I, I think that when 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 people get to talking about who's better, who's better, you do have to consider the situation as well, which is um, that in New England they needed to be that they have to be looking for their quarterback of the future and, you know, preparing for right now as well. So Cam may still be better than Mac Jones, but the Patriots may, may be saying Mac Jones is good enough that, that they're close right, right now. And that Mac Jones is at least he's going to, that we want to get him, get him in. He's good enough to put in an NFL game and that he'll get better and better as the season goes on. And then they didn't want to deal with, I, I believe, Cam and his unavailability with with COVID. And, and he reminds me of Carmelo Anthony, Dan. In that, remember when Carmelo Anthony first was out of the league and everybody was like, oh, he's washed, he can't play anymore, all all of that. But in reality, he needed to have kind of a come-to-Jesus moment and say, hold up, maybe, like, like, and and realize, because at that point in time, he wasn't willing to come off the bench. And Cam may have to right now be willing to come off the bench until he gets his next opportunity. And the question is, is he willing to do that? So I think that that's where the questions around Cam for me surround at this point in time. Yeah, it's it's funny that you say Carmelo because, you know, during the week I'm at the news desk during the Doug Gottlieb show on Fox Sports Radio. And over the last few weeks, uh, there you know, Carmelo ends up signing with the Lakers and then we have the Cam situation. So I kind of posed these questions to Doug to get his thoughts on it. And I asked him when, when Carmelo signed with the Lakers is, what what is what is Carmelo going to be most known for? Is it going to be his time in New York? Is it uh, taking the Nuggets to the Western Conference Final? Is it winning a national championship with Syracuse? And that's the same question that I actually posed with Cam Newton. Now, when you look back at Cam's career, and there was success in the NFL, it wasn't sustained success, but he was the first overall pick of a draft, and it ended up winning an MVP and taking his team to a Super Bowl. I don't know if that will pass what he did in you know, at Auburn in winning the Heisman and leading them to the national championship, though. And that's what I think is so unique about Cam Newton is because he was a face of the NFL. He was the biggest face five, six years ago because of his MVP season and what he was doing. But ultimately, when you take Cam Newton, you look at the entire body of work, I actually think that is what he did at Auburn in that one season is probably going to end up being his greatest accomplishment. Oh, see... <clears throat> I think that NFL MVP is a is a pretty doggone high achievement, even though it's not a national championship. But but he did win the Heisman and a national championship there at at, at Auburn. And when you asked the uh, question initially before we went to break, I thought about it more of his NFL career as opposed mm-hmm. to comparing his college career to his NFL career. And then I was looking, I was like, okay, hold up. How will we remember Cam in the NFL? And then they got me looking at the MVP list. And I said, okay, he will probably be remembered very similar to a guy who won the MVP right after him, which is Matt Ryan. And or like yeah. uh, like that yeah. Matt Matt Ryan, he'll be remembered as a good quarterback. Not tra- not a transcendent player, but but then I thought, okay, hold up, Cam Newton actually kind of broke the mold, if you if you will, like he's a he was Josh Allen prior to Josh Allen. You see what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like a guy who's a great athlete, big arm, all of these things, and that's what people like. If you were designing a quarterback in in a lab, Cam Newton is what you would come out with. Oh, or or Josh Allen is what you would come out with. Uh, he's a good runner. He's big, strong. He can physical enough to take a to take a hit. Willing runner. All all of these things. That's what you would. That's what you would design. You wouldn't design Tom Brady. You wouldn't design any of that. 
And that's where I think that he'll be remembered, like, like the quarterbacks who won MVPs but didn't necessarily win championships, kind of like a um, yeah. a Steve Steve McNair, Rich Gannon, or Matt Ryan. Yeah, I I actually think and and, I think, and Cam Newton runs more than Josh Allen. The guy that that I think that I think if you draw it up, it would probably would I would say it would be Aaron Rodgers because Rod because Rodgers also gives you the threat of the run with not being a running quarterback like Allen or to the next level of Cam Newton or even to the next level of that of, of Lamar Jackson. And I've I've never, never once taken away Cam's running ability and not used it in trying to judge him as a quarterback because that is completely who he was. And I've said for years that that, you know, give me Cam Newton, give me eight years of Cam Newton running the football and passing the football. I don't need 16 years of him of, you know, the last eight of him just being a pocket passer. Why? That's not if, who, if, if he's because elite it didn't, at that. And but that's he, would the, never, he never was. He had a cannon as an arm, but he would overthrow guys, cor- you know, correct. by 30 yards. Because his footwork was his footwork was atrocious like sure any any quarterback coach looks at cam and they're like oh no no don't do that <laughs> you <laughs> know <laughs> i mean it's it's really really bad it's really he, really bad he would but throw fastballs yeah he'd throw fastballs to greg olson like eight yards away and it'd be coming in at like 90 miles an hour like he like he has a can and he could throw the ball on a rope there was there was no doubt about that it's just sometimes he didn't necessarily know where it was going and wasn't hitting his intended target but what made cam so so dangerous was his ability to run and the the threat of the run. And I should actually put it the other way. It's the threat of the run and the ability to be a part of the running game because that's what he was. Like he's he like there there were there's designed runs for Cam. Like Josh Allen, when you actually look at the the numbers and see what Buffalo now is trying to do, there's they're relying a lot more on his his arm than his legs. But if you need him inside the ten or inside the five Josh Allen's going to get into the end zone for it. He's able to see. Do that's that. what I'm saying. Is you know? that is is that is that Cam was the 1.0 version, and Josh Josh Allen is the is the 2.0 version. You see yeah. what I'm saying? Where where like Michael Vick was the 1.0 version. Lamar Jackson is the 2.0 version, and and, and that he's but L- Lamar Jackson has to become a better passer. As, as as well, so like I think that Aaron Rodgers is obviously all the physical tools that you would ask for in a quarterback. He is he's got a cannon for an arm. He is smart. He's he's accurate, and I think that Patrick Mahomes is Aaron Rodgers two point oh. His so he, he's the he's the better version. Sure, sure. In 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 my mind, you know, we we posted on Twitter. Cam Newton's career, absolutely, positively, no doubt about it, 100% a success. You take a guy number one, he wins you an MVP, he takes you to a Super Bowl. You mentioned the the what you know what do LSU fans want or what do fan bases really want when you have that pick and you're looking for that guy. And to know that there were some years of growing pains and there was some other stuff, but Cam Newton ended up delivering that to Carolina, and I know they didn't get it done in the Super Bowl, but you take everything there, even if this is the absolute end, I don't think that there should be slander on well, Cam Newton's name. Think, think about this. Whose career would you uh, rather have? Or, or who had a more successful career? Uh, Andrew Luck or Cam Newton? Oh, Cam Newton. Exactly. That's that's the point. Is that that that's not an unsuccessful yeah. ca- ca- career? Whose career has been been more successful, Cam Newton's or Matt Ryan's? Uh, I I would take Cam's with the. College I would take Cam too. In. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd, I'd take Cam's with the with the college added into there because I think that plays a part as well. Yep. He's George. He's George Reister. I'm Dan Byer. This is Fox Sports Sunday. Get George on Twitter at George Reister. You can find me on Twitter at Dan Bayer on Fox. The Cowboys enter Thursday night's opener a bit shorthanded. We'll explain how it will affect them against the Bucks next year on Fox Sports Sunday. Fox Sports Sunday on this Labor Day weekend. He's George Reister. I'm Dan Bayer. We're talking NFL. We're all friends here as Adam Kaplan, our Fox Sports Radio NFL insider, also Sirius XM NFL Radio, and the Inside the Birds podcast joins us here on Fox Sports Radio. Little Birdie told me, Adam, that you uh, were weighing in on George's options when it came to 
Cam Newton or. <laughs> and when it came to Cam Newton or Matt Ryan in terms of a career, you would choose who? I think Matt Ryan's had a better career, but I'm probably going to be in the minority here because just how Cam has kind of regressed in the last three years. Mm-hmm. Certainly would have said that three years ago, but I'm, I just don't know where Cam is at this point of his career. I mean, he's only 32, but I, I just don't know what he has left. I never thought I'd say that, but it's been a while since he's played highly competent football. Sure. Let, let, let yeah. me ask well, you this. Or, or go ahead, go ahead, George. Sure. Then I'll then I'll follow up because yes. okay. it's a different. Yeah, Adam. Adam, my my only I guess retort for that is yes. Um, Matt Ryan's been a 4,000 yard passer pretty much every year of his entire career, but like the touchdowns aren't very high. And, and also he doesn't make the playoffs on a regular basis. Like, so, so like, that's where I'm like, I got six in one hand, half a dozen in the other one. And Cam has at least been a transcendent player on some levels. I mean, if you would have asked me after 17, I, I would say, no, Cam clearly is. You know, if you just look at the way that he was playing at 28 years old with, with the Panthers, and then you know the shoulder injuries, um, his inability to to kind of recover from that the right way, and I think what happened there was the accumulation of hits uh, to that right shoulder just did it's kind of cur- curtailed his career. I, I know he was healthy enough to play uh, clearly in training camp, but he clearly got beaten out by Mac Jones. So you know, since he was 28, it's been downhill. And I, I, I but again, the quarterback position is one I've learned this you know, pretty much throughout my career here. I've seen guys move on and later in, in their careers just kind of respond. And I'm hoping you know, Cam now at, at 32 could be one of those guys where people think he's finished. You know, he gets himself right. He goes with a team that wants him and gives him a chance to rebuild his career. And I, I, the other thing is there's been this sort of narrative around the league that he maybe he wouldn't be a good backup. If he's not a starter, then it might not work. I don't know about that. I, I, I want to see what happens here uh, when he revives his career here over the next few months and see what happens as a backup. Adam Kaplan joining us here on Fox Sports Radio. The angle that I was going to go with something that George and I talked about. If you are a franchise and you take a quarterback number one overall, like what should your expectations, you know, what should they have been? Were they, do you think the, Cal, the Carolina Panthers would have been satisfied or should be satisfied with what Cam provided them during his time there? Well, look, he got to a Super Bowl. Um, he was, as George said, a, really just special at one point in his career. Yeah. What, what the, a, a, really a dual threat, and with that size and arm strength and athleticism, it's all everything that you want. And then, yeah, I, I would say, yeah, I would say that, yeah, because again, he got to the Super Bowl. Yeah, You're quite, I agree. It, it's a great question. It's actually a great debate. What for a first round pick? How many years do you have to get out of the player? My thing is, you better get a second contract, or, or the guy's a disappointment or a bust. Well, they got way more than that. So I, no, they, they, I would say to answer your question, it's a great one. I would absolutely say they got they got plenty out of him. And. Like I'm looking at at Adam, kind of the start to this season, and with Dak Prescott, and people are saying that oh he's completely healthy, he's trump- trumpeting his, his horn, and so are the coaches. I don't quite believe him a hundred percent. Do you? Here's where I am at, George, with this right shoulder strain. It's not in a normal area where you would just strain your muscle and two weeks will be fine. It's in an odd area. Uh, so the way they had to rebuild his shoulder in terms of strength is they he would just toss it around lightly. Then he went to 7-on-7, seven seven, and this week he'll do 11-on-11. 11 11, and that's great. And they say it'll be fine for week one and, and so forth. But here's the thing, as you know, being a player, you don't know how a player responds to an injury like this until he gets hit. And we, you cannot hit quarterbacks in practice, as you know. That's why they wear a red jersey. So until we see the Bucks, who have one of the best defenses in football, throw him to the ground on Thursday night. We're just not going to know how it responds and, and how he opens it up, too. Because, you know, they, one thing the Cowboys have is they've got a great receiver core. They're, they're very deep there. And we, we could talk about the offensive line issues that they have now, which are definitely troubling which, with the news that came out today. But, you know, overall, I'm very anxious to see how far downfield Dak could throw. And then when he does, in-game, by the way, in-game, does he keep doing it or is he sore and do they reduce it? See, that's the thing we just don't know yet. See, that's how you know Adam Kaplan's a professional because we teased it. So he knew that we were going to ask him I the question. So, I yeah, so I'll do it. <laughs> Zach Martin tests positive for COVID-19, not going to yeah. be there Thursday. How does that affect them against that defensive line and that defensive front of Tampa? Yeah, one note, just so you know, he's got to wait five days. Even if he, even if he gets two negative tests within 24 hours, he's got to wait five days due to the protocol. So that would get be Friday. It's a day after the game. So he's ineligible to play this week. Uh, Connor Williams, uh, who's their 
uh, is their other guard there. He just came off the COVID list, so they're going to get him back. He actually practiced today. They just got Lyle Collins back, the right tackle, from his neck injury. Remember, he missed all last season. Now, Connor McGovern, who was a third-round pick three years ago, uh, he will start for uh, Connor Williams, and that really crushes their depth on the interior of their offensive line. And one thing I do want to mention about the Bucs is I think we forget how good their defense was. It was shaky in the first half of last season, but they wanted a great run with Todd Bowles, and that's why Todd is probably going to be head coach next year because he really got this thing going. It's really one of the most underrated parts. Everybody talks about Brady, and rightfully so, but let's not forget about how good their defense is. Yeah, and this these are times where we're looking at kind of the changing of, of, of offense, the changing the way coaches – handle handle things um how how do you like how do general managers and uh front office people that you talk to look at seeing how the quarterback position is changing because it seems like now that guys like justin fields um trevor lawrence josh allen that these mobile quarter not not running quarterbacks trey lance but, too. <laughs> yeah exactly that that this is the uh, future as opposed to the statue Tom Brady quarterbacks that those seem like that they're gone forever. Oh, it's changed, George. I'm so glad you brought this up. It's the so-called second reaction quarterback. When the pocket breaks down like Russell Wilson, what can he do with his legs? Yeah, you. if you really look at this draft, and Zach Wilson could drop back, but I mean, he can move. He's not such a, st- yep. uh, you know, a stone feet, so to speak. Yeah, you don't really see... The statuesque quarterback being that guy that they draft much anymore. They they want go, Trevor Lawrence as an athlete. He can move. He could do both. Obviously, yeah. I I would say it's fair. And and what teams are doing? Another thing uh, to this, what you're asking, what we're seeing now is teams are more willing to go with better depth on the interior of their defensive line. You want guys who could rush the passer and collapse the pocket, because quarterbacks hate the pressure up the middle. And you're seeing teams uh, loading up in the middle and, and having these special players. At the tackle, you're Aaron Donald to the world, uh, Fletcher Cox, guys like that. They're hard to find, but when you could find that, uh, you hold on to those guys. That, that, that's the thing now about this league. You've got to be able to make these quarterbacks move because they can move. If you move them up their spot, you've got a much better success uh, rate uh, against that quarterback. Adam Kaplan joining us here on Fox Sports Radio. Get him on Twitter, at Kaplan NFL. Last one for me. I know it's kind of general, but I think that it fits as we're talking uh, the season starting this week. Are the Kansas City Chiefs immune from a Super Bowl hangover? You know, we've seen it in the past. I know the Rams didn't make the playoffs. The 49ers had injuries last year, even though the Rams won nine games the next year. But there has been a history of teams after they lose the Super Bowl having that hangover. Is Kansas City immune from that? No. I, I Well, let's put it this way. They addressed what they had to address. They had to rebuild the offensive line. Well, guess what? They're going to have five new starters this season. Uh, well, Four, four right now for sure, and then five with if Duvernay Tardif could come back from his broken hand this week, then he could start. But Trey Smith right now is starting at right guard. But they've got good depth now in the offensive line, really good depth. But the issue that they have, guys, it's not about a hangover. Uh, it's depth at certain positions. They have zero depth at receiver. I mean, they just don't. Byron Pringle is a kickoff returner. Uh, he's their top backup receiver. He's actually been a nice story of development. He's definitely a receiver now and, and, a, and a returner. Um, not, they don't have a lot of depth in defensive line. That would concern me. But I don't think there's any kind of hangover. Then you got the Chris Jones legal situation. We have to see how that plays out. You know, but overall, no, I think, they're, I think they're in fine shape. They're obviously a lock to win the division. The question is, how much better now is the AFC? Is there anyone who could seriously challenge them? That, that, that to me, is the question right now. Um, Adam, we have been hearing all, all last week from, from Brian Flores telling us that two is his guy, telling his team that. And he's been so adamant about it. I understand he's been questioned about it a lot. But, yep. you know, it's one of those things I'm like, are you trying to convince us or you're trying to convince yourself? So um, <laughs> right. what the qu- quarterback? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I, I know that they want to to believe that he's got total confidence in him. But what's the actual, I guess, realistic view of the Miami Dolphins about how they view Tua? Well, I've said for now, gosh, five or six months that they're cl- they're clearly not completely sold on him. Uh, they're just not. Um, they they like him. I look, they drafted him fifth overall, but the fact that they pulled him out twice last season, they would have pulled him out a third time and benched him in week seventeen against Buffalo, where they got blown out. He he played poorly, but Ryan Fitzpatrick was on the COVID list, so they couldn't do that. 
So that's not a good thing. I mean, you, when you if you pull your quarterback three times, what what you know, what are you really saying here? Now, is, is there, are they going to do this again with Jacoby Brissett as a relief pitcher? You can't do that. That's not a good way to build a quarterback's confidence. You never do that with a proven veteran. And now you, the other thing is the other shoe here is obviously Deshaun Watson and all the rumors. And you know we've talked about this probably twenty times over the last ten weeks or so on on our on our uh, segment here. The, the fact of the matter is they've never denied that they had interest in, in Deshaun Watson. They've never shut it down, never put a statement out, because the fact is they've had interest in him. And that tells you, George, with your question, uh, they're not completely sold on him. If, if they were sold on Tua, they never would entertain the thought of or calling the Texans as they have in the past. Next week at this time, we will be talking about actual yeah. NFL re- regular wait. season games. Can't wait. Adam, we appreciate it. Yeah, looking forward to next week. Thanks. We'll do it again then. All right, guys. Good luck. Thank you. Adam Kaplan, our Fox Sports Radio NFL insider, also here on the Inside the Birds podcast and Sirius XM NFL Radio. Find him on Twitter at Kaplan NFL. It's our final edition of Easy as 1, 2, 3, 4 of 2021. It comes up after Ralph Irvin gives us the latest of what's going on, including a big comeback in one Major League Baseball city. Ralph, it is all yours. Give a boy a bat and a ball. And he will dream of the bases loaded. (laughs) Two outs in the bottom of the ninth, down three. And today, that boy is Daniel Vogelbach. Swing and a drive to right and deep. Get up, get up, get out of here. Gone for Daniel Vogelbach. He just hit a walk-off grand slam home. And who else to deliver it but Bob Euchre on the Brewers Radio Network? <laughs> it can't oh. get much better than that in the world of sports highlights. Uh, Milwaukee does beat St. Louis 6-5 on the walk-off Grand Slam. Meanwhile, Houston gets home runs from Yuli Gurriel and Carlos Correa. They're now tied with San Diego, locked at three in the top of the eighth inning. Seattle and Arizona tied at three. They're in the ninth. And Texas holding a 7-3 advantage over the Angels. That's in the seventh inning. It's just gone final. The Cubs, 11-8 winners over Pittsburgh. Frank Schwindel with a grand slam. That's the difference in the ball game. At the PGA Tour Championship, Patrick Cantley is your winner, finishing at 21 under par, one shot ahead of John Rahm. It's Cantley's fourth win of the season and headed into singles on Monday at the Solheim Cup. The Europe has a 9-7 lead. We send it back now. It is Dan Beyer and George Reister. Ralph, don't go too far because you will serve as a lifeline to George Reister, as will Iowa Sam, our technical producer, and our executive producer, Ryan Bershinger, as we play our final episode again of 2021 of Easy As 1, 2, 3, 4. I give George a topic. He doesn't have to give me all of the correct answers, just some of them, and he has the three guys there to help him out as lifelines. The over-under set today, George, Listen, I, I think that there are two easy questions. I think that there are two difficult questions. We're going to make it seven and a half, okay? Over Ooh, under seven wow. and a half today. Well, so, listen, I'm still protesting from two games ago, so I'm just letting you know. <laughs> All right. I don't think there's anything to protest here. I think it's everything's pretty much cut and dry, just like it was a few weeks ago. I digress. George, name one of two schools – that were part of the Southwest Conference when it disbanded in 1996 that won't be in the new SEC or the new Big 12. So the Southwest Conference ended up breaking up in 1996, and you had the Big 12 forming. What two schools were a part of that Southwest Conference that won't be in the new Big 12 and won't be in the new SEC? Oh, my God. That won't... Oh. Yes. There won't be in the Big 12 or yeah. the SEC. Okay, so... This is one of the tougher ones. So the Southwest Conference had pretty much all the Texas schools in it, and plus, like, Arkansas and uh, all the... Okay, hold up. So, uh, all right. I know that... I do remember that Rice was in there, I don't remember when they got out, but I do know that obviously they are a, you know, still in conference USA Mm -hmm. or the AAC or whatever. So 
aside from them, I can't think of anybody else because TCU, Texas Tech, Texas, Baylor, all the all of those Texas schools were in it, and they're still going to be in the new Big 12. So I'm going to go with Rice. Okay. All right. Uh, Wait. Show- yeah. Oh, God. Yeah. I should. I, I started to say SMU, but I don't remember. Yeah. I'm going to go with Rice, though. All right. Show me Rice. There they are, the Rice Owls, one of two schools. The other school was SMU. Yes, they – they were a part of the Southwest Conference uh, when it disbanded in 1996. You mentioned Arkansas. Arkansas ducked out in 1991 uh, to join the SEC. But, yeah, Houston was actually a part of that Southwest Conference as well. Yeah, it, it was it like an entire Texas conference plus Arkansas. It was the weirdest thing. <laughs> all right, George. Off and running, one for one, and all of your lifelines still available. Name two of three SEC schools that don't have a win yet this college football season. All right. So you had in the SEC, I know Tennessee won. Oh, LSU lost. Duh. We just talked about that. Um, And, oh, God. All right. I'm going to call on Mr. Ralph Irvin, because while I'm thinking, because, oh my God, I just tweeted about this. I just tweeted about it. It's freaking Vanderbilt because they, because Vanderbilt, Illinois, um, uh, and uh, Washington and some school, they took terrible, terrible lo- lo- losses. Uh, Vanderbilt lost to some directional school. I don't remember which. So it's Vanderbilt and it's uh, obviously LSU, which we talked about earlier. All right. So you don't need Ralph on this one. You're going to nope, go I was, on your I was going to call Ralph because he, he would know from the updates. Yeah, he's at the news desk. Uh, all right. Show me LSU. Yes, we know that they lost to UCLA and don't have a win yet on the season. And show me Vanderbilt. Yes, they lost to East Tennessee 23-3 to yesterday. The other school that doesn't have a win, Ole Miss, because they haven't played yet. So there was that was part of a trick question. Oh, because ex- they play on Monday versus yes. Lou, uh, Louisville. Yes, they do, with no Lane Kiffin because of, uh, because of COVID. So George Reister is 3 of 3, and that 7.5 is looking pretty tasty. All right, George, name 3 of 4. You have all your lifelines left as well. And three of four Stanford players that finished as a runner-up in the Heisman voting over the last 20 years. Okay. There have been four Stanford with... players that were runner-up in the Heisman voting. Need three okay. of them. Oh, God. This is a uh, – okay. I This is a layup, dude. This is Christian McCaffrey, Toby Gerhardt, and Andrew Luck. All right. Those are your final answers? Yep. All right, show me Andrew Luck. Yeah, he actually did it twice, 2010 and 2011. was a runner-up uh, two years for Stanford. Show me Christian McCaffrey. 2015, some people still say that he should have won. He should have won. That if, year. If, yep, if, if he weren't white, he would have he would have won. Um, if he weren't white and the Pac-12 weren't playing at 8 p.m., which is 11 p.m. Eastern, he would have won. And show me Toby Gerhardt. There it is, 2009. The other one, there was another, Bryce Love, 2017. Yeah, I, see, I couldn't remember whether Bryce Love finished second or not, but, yeah, that was – but but the other three I knew for for sure. And you, you put this as an over-under of seven today? Well, uh, well, the, the reason was I didn't know if you would get the first one. I figured you would actually get the Vanderbilt and uh, LSU ones and maybe even catch on with the Ole Miss. This one, the Stanford one, was kind of a layup, I thought. Because oh, yeah. The, and, and, but it was what was surprising, the reason that it was included, was that five times in the last 12, 13 seasons, a Stanford player has finished as the runner-up 
in the Heisman. It was even just looking at the column. It was kind of if you're an OCD person, it was like Stanford, Stanford, Stanford. And I'm like, oh my goodness, how many times did they finish runner up? Yeah, five times, four different players because Andrew Luck had it twice. All right. George has not used any of his lifelines, so Ralph Irvin, Iowa Sam, and Ryan Bershinger will mm-hmm. all be available to him on the last question of the 2021 edition of Easy as 1, 2, 3, 4. Get George on Twitter at George Reister. You can find me, Dan Beyer, on Twitter at Dan Beyer on Fox. You can play along next to right here on Fox Sports Radio. Fox Sports Sunday. He's George Reister. I'm Dan Beyer. I hope you're having a fun Labor Day weekend. If you're on the roads, please be safe. Don't go speeding everywhere. I want you to uh, comply with the speed limit, right, George? Got to be safe on those roads. Yes, you do. Oh, although in Southern California, you know, my family, uh, 99.9% of my family is still back in the state of Wisconsin. And they always say, like, how's the traffic out there? And I'm like, it's actually pretty easy to drive because you don't go anywhere. Like, you can't go anywhere. With, you know, you're like going 10, 15 miles per hour on the freeway. So don't worry. It's pretty safe that way. But oh, on weekends of, like this, it's a little wide, you know, more wide open. Speaking of that, real real quick, are you are you okay after Saturday? Uh, why is that? Your what? Badgers. Oh, well, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm fine. I've never really cheered for Wisconsin. We've been over this. Oh, I Never forgot yeah. you are an Ohio State yeah. fan, and you got to get your yeah. ass kicked this weekend. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, you feel that good about your team, huh? We'll, oh, we'll dude, see. dude, uh, you oh, okay? Real, real question: How did you feel about C.J. Stroud's initial performance? Yeah, I think that there was a, a lot to be desired, but as yes, I, the further the, away and I and came the from stats, it, the, completely the. The uh, stats looked way better than his actual game, right? Yes. But I yeah. also think of the situation that they were in, and I feel a little bit better about it. So Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think it's going to be a good game and exciting. So, uh, I, Thibodeau's I supp- status is the, I think, is the. No, the no. Thing. He's, it, as it's in, he's, in, he's in, fine. In pro, pro tip. He'll be, he'll be out there. <laughs> All right, all right, and and I mean, I, obviously he won't be one hundred, but if if he gets to ninety five, I think ninety five percent of him is probably, you know, better than better than probably every other defensive lineman in college football. So he he should still have an impact, but that's literally all he's going to be be doing because school school hasn't even started at Oregon yet. So what do you think he's been doing ever since he got in the locker room yesterday? Treatment. I wonder Treatment. if that's why they sleeping kept him in the out. hyperbaric, yeah. sleeping in the hyperbaric, uh, uh, ankle above your heart massage. Dude, he's not even going to get a chance to go home. Probably. He'll probably <laughs> just sleep at the facility. Well, maybe he's listening right now, and maybe he's playing along in easy as one, two, three, four. Because George, you have an opportunity to end this season's episodes with a perfect score, six for six so far, and you have all three of your lifelines left. Oh, Let's yeah. see if you can get the final question, George. Again, six for six so far. Name four of five, George, in our final question. NFL teams that have the longest droughts of appearing. In a conference title game. So the five NFL teams, I just need four of them, that have had the longest droughts of appearing in a AFC or NFC conference title game. Hmm. <sighs> okay. 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 If we think about this, right? Like that. Like All your AFC, lifelines are there, you know. I, I I I I know I want to talk through it the way I can give them the parameters, right? Okay. So obviously you have to have teams that haven't been any good. Like so, I'm thinking the Lions have to be in there. But now I'm going to call on Mr. Ralph Irvin. Um, who do you have? I already got the Lions. They're okay. well, they're Cleveland locked in. Has not been in since I can't even tell you. Okay, okay. I'm I would say Cleveland. Cle- I'm I w- in with the Cleveland Browns. And, and I would say this, because I don't think Houston's ever been there, so they've been around since, what, 2000 No, 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 no. They've been around since like 90. 90- the Texans? Yeah. Oh, no, 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 no. They, they came in after the Jaguars because I was yeah. in the league. 
league when they expanded. So, so I mean, you figure it's got to be over 20 years for anybody you're thinking about. Um, well, shoot, the Dallas Cowboys haven't been in that long. All right, we're under 30 seconds, okay, George. Okay, Dallas and the Houston Texans, I'll, I'll give them that. All right, you don't, you don't want a bit from Ryan or Sam? You yeah, guys okay. got any team quick? Sam. Throw out a, throw out a team, I was Sam. All right, here are my teams that you didn't list. All right, I had uh, the Bengals and the Dolphins. Bengals and the Dolphins. Had Hugh, so we had Houston, Cleveland, Bengals, Lions, Dolphins, Dallas. Got oh, 30 Lord seconds to go. Mercy. I'd like I like Bengals and Browns and, and, and Lions if you need three. Okay, you need I, four? I'll go with Bengals, Browns, okay. Lions. I'm going to go with Bengals, Browns, Lions, and Dolphins. Okay, show me the Bengals. All right, the Bengals, 32 years. Show me the Lions. 29 years. Show me the Browns. And for the win, show me the Dolphins. Yes! Fox Sports Radio has the best sports talk lineup in the nation. Catch all of our shows at foxsportsradio.com. And within the iHeartRadio app, search FSR to listen live. The NFL season is fast approaching, but we have to quickly look back at George's perfect score on easy as one, two, three, four. If you just missed it, I just have to pay it off because we hit right up against the break with your 10th and correct answer, George, of the NFL teams that have the longest droughts of appearing in a conference title game. Bengals the longest at 32. We mentioned the Lions at 29. Washington also, it's been 29 years. If you remember, 1991, Barry Sanders and the Lions went to Washington, ended up losing that game, but neither team has been back to the NFC Championship game since there. The Browns, even with two years off as a franchise, had their uh, streak at 28, and then the Dolphins at 28 years of not appearing in a conference title. The Cowboys were oh so close at 25 years, followed by the Texans at 19, and then... The Raiders, 18 years since they've been in a conference title game. All of those wow, teams looking it, wait, to end the droughts up. this that year. That was 18 years ago that, like, Rich Gannon was quarterback? Yes, yes, Good it was. God, dude, I'm old. <laughs> hey, no. I know time time sure flies, doesn't it? That was I uh, mean, granted, granted I was I was still in I I'm, I think it was in Wait, eighteen years ago, that was what two thousand three. Oh, that was the that was the year I got drafted. I'm still I'm still I'm still young. I'm still that would have yeah. That was uh, then they ended up losing to the Buccaneers in Super Bowl thirty seven. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that season, and then just uh, yeah, I have not been back. What was crazy was looking at the list and actually seeing the number of teams that have that have made it somewhat recently. Um, that is kind of like the, you know, just as a, as a Seahawks fan, it's been six seasons since they've been to a conference title game. And they were actually a bit further up on the list than I thought. I thought they would have been, you know, maybe, you know, would have been one of the shorter droughts, but it wasn't because you've just had certain teams being able to, to crack through, you know, the bills last year ended their drought and, uh, you know, Packers and chiefs had made it in back to back years, but you know, the 49ers uh, making it uh, the two seasons ago and, and the Buccaneers ending their drought from when they made it to the Super Bowl. So, yeah, so there was there were some there were some longer streaks that were ended last season, but there's still some longer ones there. But it's crazy to think that the Raiders and and, you know, the Cowboys has talked about so much. But Washington was the one that actually really threw me for a curve because. They played in that game against the Lions, and that was the last time both of them made it to the uh, to the conference championship games. So I, I don't know if we're going to get a repeat of Buffalo and Kansas City this year, but I do want to start to preview and look ahead to what we have in store in the 2021 season. And as George and I have gotten together on every Sunday throughout the summer talking football, I, I just I, I may sound like a broken record, but I just think that the AFC is a superior conference to the NFC, and it's not meant to be a, a hot take. But when you're trying to figure out the seven teams that will make the playoffs in in each conference, I think in the NFC you're trying to figure out, okay, are there seven teams, whereas opposed to the AFC, you're just trying to figure out what seven teams are going to make it and which ones are being left out. I just think there's m- many more candidates for postseason appearances in the AFC than there is the NFC. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. This is a This is a year – to where 
And we're in another era, I think, of the NFL where we're going to have a bunch of repeat performances like that, that, that where, you know, for so many years, the Colts and the Steelers and the, uh, and the Patriots were always in it, right? Like one of, one of them was always in it. And then you look at now with the AFC, you got Kansas city, just, just racking it up three, Mm -hmm. three years in in a row now. And then, and before that, well, and and also, so it'll be either Kansas City or the Bills in there for the for the foreseeable future. Um, yeah, so uh, this is cyclical. It's just different teams now. When when I asked Adam Kaplan last hour, and for those of you that missed it, you can always check it out on the podcast at foxsportsradio.com. When I asked Adam Kaplan about are the Chiefs immune from a hangover, it actually was a legitimate question. Because I do believe that there is such a thing as a Super Bowl hangover when you lose. Because yeah, it's proven. I, yeah, and and I just would think as a player that you have to go and go through everything that you went through the year before, and it has to pay off again. Like of all the work that you put in, it's a long season, it's a long grind. You overcome obstacles. And then to fall one step short and then realize that you're back at the starting line and have to do it again when you didn't accomplish your goal, I think would just be frustrating. That, that it's, it's, I don't know if it's like a shoots and ladders sort of thing, George, but when you have to, uh, when you have to fall back and start from you know, the beginning or close to the beginning, it's frustrating. And that's what I think would build in with a team and why I think that teams like have a difficult time when they lose because you put so much in and you still didn't accomplish oh, your goal look, that you don't have something to show for it. Okay, so aside from the Patriots, because you have to throw them throw them out, yeah. and, and the uh, Chiefs, because the Chiefs made it back after. Well, actually, the uh, Chiefs just, just lost, so we'll see what happens this year. But, okay, look what happened to the, uh, the 49ers, 49ers in 2019. The Rams in 2018, they've fallen off. Uh, well, they they fell the one, off, and then they made the playoffs again this year. The Atlanta Falcons, this ain't even the same team. Like they didn't even make the playoffs and, after and, that. And I would say this: that the Falcons that year, they they because they did go back against the Philadelphia, and they played in that that crazy game where the Eagles ended up almost losing. But the Falcons that first half of the year, they were not good. I, I no. thought that the Super Bowl was a hangover for them. And getting back to that point was was difficult, um, and, and like that oh. Super Bowl hungover. They did make the playoffs the next year, but yeah, they, but it, uh, it, they it the hasn't been team. the same. Like ever Correct. since then, it's been all downhill. The Carolina Panthers been all downhill kind of since they lost the Super Bowl. Like there have been so many teams that this has happened to. They happened to the Giants. Happened to the the uh, Saints fell off for a second after they did uh, that Super mm-hmm. Bowl loser hangover is very very real. Yeah, and and the take the Seahawks when they ended up losing to the Patriots in Super Bowl forty nine, they made it to the playoffs the next year, and they faced Carolina who ended up going to the Super Bowl. Carolina put you know like thirty five on them in the first like it was like the Seahawks had to come back and make it a game. But they they weren't that Super Bowl caliber team, and then the next year Falcons ran them off the field. So there's there is a bit of a there is something to it, and maybe it's a hangover of not it's not necessarily talking about not making the playoffs, but the reason why I just think it's 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 a legitimate question with Kansas City is because there are so many contenders, and if the Chiefs end up losing in the divisional playoffs or don't get the number one overall seed, I would think that maybe some of that Super Bowl hangover is a part of that. And I think that there are, you talked about the Bills knocking on the door. I really think Cleveland has an opportunity. It's amazing on how much, George, we have talked about the Cleveland Browns in years past. And now they finally have a good season, a really good season. They end their playoff drought, and there's no drama in Cleveland anymore. So we're not even talking about them. We're, we're like we're not even talking about is Odell Beckham Jr. going to ruin the chemistry now that he's coming back from his knee injury. Like we're not even having that conversation. And I bring that up, not saying that he's going to ruin the chemistry, but that is what you get in sports talk radio. Yeah. You get well, the hot takes like that, and we're not even talking about that because I think people believe that Cleveland is on such solid footing entering this year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. they and with the way that Baker Mayfield played last season. 
you actually believe that they will be able to integrate Odell Beckham Jr. in back into their offense with without Baker feeling like he needs to force him the ball. Yeah. Because he is so so good, which actually should like if he's organically getting the football, then everything will be a a okay. The only thing that could put a monkey wrench in a program is that if Baker, if he can't deal with him, if he can't deal with Odell Beckham being, you know, that guy, you know what I mean, and 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 wanting the ball, but also. Him being well, able to manage the game and get him the ball organically instead of, you know, forcing it to him. This is going to come out as a negative towards Odell Beckham Jr. But in reality, George, it's the first time the team has had leverage over Odell Beckham Jr. in where they are. Because you could say that the Giants needed him desperately. They, they needed him on the field because Eli Manning needed somebody to throw to. They needed his talents. And then when he came over via the trade – you're saying, wow, okay, now Cleveland has their number one receiver. Baker Mayfield's going to you know, need a guy like that. They're going to need that all-pro receiver. Odell's got to get his – you know, he's got to get his. And now because of the success that they had with the running game and Nick Chubb and what they've done with their offensive line and the way that Baker has played, you can make the argument, maybe most importantly to what you said, is he's coming back from a knee injury and they th- seem to thrive without him last year, that the team doesn't need him that the Browns actually have the leverage over Odell Beckham Jr. instead of vice versa. So it's going to be up to Odell Beckham Jr. And this isn't uh, isn't a referendum on Odell Beckham Jr., but if if he's not fitting in, the Browns will just go on. They've got Jarvis Landry. They've got Donovan Peoples-Jones. They've got other guys. They they, They proved last year that they don't need him. And, I, I don't and, think they need him. Like, well, no, no, no. I'm sorry. I do think that they need him to win a Super Bowl. But, but here's the other thing. I don't think he necessarily wants to be there either. Like, I think that he would rather be somewhere else. He doesn't like. There is nothing about Odell Beckham Jr. and his personality and all that stuff that that says I want to live in Cleveland. You see what I'm saying? Sure. Like, like th- that. Now that I don't believe so so while he may have to be be out he won't be he won't cry about it he'll be like oh well you know it's very very unfortunate I gave it my uh, best hopefully you don't send me to Minnesota you know what I mean (laughs) he's like he's like send me to Miami send me to LA send me to Houston just the, I mean dude he reminds me a little bit in that way of James Harden like imagine James Harden having to play for the Timberwolves or having to play for uh you know like a team that is geographically undesirable sure sure I get I get what you're saying I I do think I do think that Odell wants to win. I do, I, I, I do believe that because there were, there were times with the Giants where after losses he was uh, frustrated. So I do believe that that is the case. But they don't have to force the ball to him any, any, anymore. Baker doesn't have that on his shoulders because they proved last year that they were, they were just fine when he went out w- with the knee injury. To your point, yeah, it would be great if they had him and he could help aid them to their Super Bowl. But in the overall point of this whole conversation is – we're not even talking about that. Like Cleveland's not even in the conversation. And how different is it? Because we would talk about them in years past because of how dysfunctional they were. But now I think it's such a stable franchise and a stable team under Kevin Stefanski that we're not even having those conversations. We're talking more about what Pittsburgh's going to do with Big Ben and is his arm going to hold up? What's going to happen with the Colts? Who, by the way, I really liked the Colts this offseason. I was a big fan of the Colts, even with mm-hmm. Carson Wentz as the, the, the starting quarterback. However, I can't think of one good thing that has happened to the Colts in this this training camp in this offseason. <laughs> Dude, I, they I, are. I mean, it is always a story with them, COVID-related, not COVID-related. Uh, it's Murphy's Law, dude. It, yeah. Whatever can go wrong has gone wrong for for them. And I'm a person, I like... Dan, I I was completely opposite on you as it related to Carson Wentz and their and their offseason. I didn't mm-hmm. like it. I think that it's very risky because I mean if if Frank Wright can fix him, then you're fine. But there's no guarantee that you can fix him. You know hear I me? Mean? Yeah. Yeah. No, that's it's very fair. I I am believing that he will be better. 
But I also then believed, too, that T.Y. Hilton would be healthy, and T.Y. Hilton's not healthy. Like, nothing has gone well for the Colts Quint- this offseason. Quentin off Nelson, even though he may be out there, is <laughs> not 100%. Yeah. Carson Wentz is not 100%. And th- this was something yeah. that I asked the, the other day, Dan. I was like, how long is Carson Wentz's leash considering he didn't get a full training camp, all of this stuff. Like how long are Colts fans and Frank Reich have to be patient if he has a slow start? Well, I, I, I think that they're going to have to be patient because I don't think that they're ready to turn it over to Jacob Eason, especially if Sam Ellinger was, was pushing him in the preseason. I think that tells you all you need to know. Yeah, but I, I mean, I'm saying like, when do you start positioning for a draft pick for next season? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, it could it, it could be a one and done because uh, I honestly think that their core, like, you got a good running back, you've got your offensive line, your defense is actually one of the better ones in the NFL. Um, you just paid Darius Leonard a lot of money, um, so like, like your window is now. So I think that the patience is going to be um, thinner. You know, not not as not not as long as it would be in other situations. I it just and and it hasn't been a good off season. I I I, I, lo- I the AFC. I think that there are about ten teams that could make the playoffs. I, I I don't think that the Jets are in contention. Houston and Jacksonville aren't. I don't think Cincinnati is, and I don't think that the Raiders are. So of those five teams, that means eleven other teams. I actually think have an opportunity. I think Denver's got a chance. I think the Chargers have a chance. But at the top, and that's where we start. I actually think that Kansas City, Buffalo, and Cleveland are your top three teams. I, I like Cleveland winning the AFC North this year. Crazy as it sounds, George. He is George Reister. I'm Dan Beyer. This is Fox Sports Sunday. Get George on Twitter at George Reister. You can find me on Twitter at Dan Beyer on Fox. All right, that's the AFC. Who can dethrone Tom Brady and the Buccaneers in the NFC? That conversation next year on Fox Sports Sunday. So the Cowboys shorthanded against the Buccaneers team, George, as we take a look at the NFC that has every starter returning from a year ago as they try to defend their Super Bowl crowd. Sometimes having everybody back isn't a great thing when you have certain teams, but in Tampa it is a really good thing when your quarterback's Tom Brady and you have a defense uh, like that defense played towards the end of last season. Yeah, when you return everybody from a Super Bowl team, that's functional, right? Like you don't have people fighting over contracts, trying to hold out all of it. Like it's functional. That makes you extremely dangerous. And that's what the Buccaneers have right, right now. And I I just, obviously there are things that can happen to cause them to not to be able to make the Super Bowl again. Not necessarily win it, but make the Super Bowl again. And that's obviously injuries. But aside from injuries, there doesn't appear to be anything that can derail them because Tom Tom Brady's not going to come out and suck. So, <laughs> and 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 between Tom. Mike and between Mike Evans, Antonio Brown, and Godwin, and then their tight end situation with Gronk. Uh, O.J. Howard and uh, Brayton, and like, <laughs> like what's what's this, what's gonna have? Like they have well, so much depth that even if even if Mike Williams caught caught what what whatever's going on with J- Jamar Chase and he can't catch the ball, then you still have enough guys and quality guys that they'd be like, okay, Mike, just just sit out. We'll the, we'll start An- Antonio Brown and Chris Godwin. Who would complain about that? Yeah, not not many teams, uh, really. I mean, and we saw in the Super Bowl, Tom does like to go to guys that he relies on, and another year with Evans and another year with Godwin helps all of that. I do think that there are two things with the Buccaneers that I do think are up in the air. I still think that their running game, Ronald Jones, Leonard Fournette, and they did bring in Gio Bernard. 